Please take your Bibles and go to Titus chapter 2, if you would, please. Titus chapter 2. I want to preach a message entitled, Our Great Savior. Our Great Savior. The key verse of this passage, of course, is uh, verse 13. I'm going to read verses 11 to 14 of Titus chapter 2. Familiar passage of Scripture to be sure. Titus, I believe, is a pastoral epistle. It's uh, instructions that Paul gives to another young preacher in the faith, Titus. And this is also a leadership book. It teaches leadership principles in these three chapters. And he begins here in Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. It says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. So that really lets us know that the gospel is available to everyone. And if a person uh, acts on the light that they have, God will make sure that they receive more light. So in His sovereignty and in His predestination, He has seen fit to give man light. Uh, according to Romans chapter 1 and chapter 2, we know that the two witnesses for God has always been creation as well as the conscience of man. And so here it says that His salvation has appeared to all men. And then it says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Verse 13, looking for that blessed hope, and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I like the song, Our Great Savior. Jesus, what a friend for sinners. Jesus, lover of my soul. Friends may fail me, foes assail me. He, my Savior, makes me whole. Jesus, what a strength and weakness. Let me hide myself in him. Tempted, tried, and sometimes failing, he my strength, my victory wins. Jesus, what a help in sorrow, while the billows o'er me roll. Even when my heart is breaking, he my comfort helps my soul. Jesus, what a guide and keeper, while the tempest still is high. Storms about me, night o'ertakes me, he my pilot Here's my cry. Jesus, I do now receive him. More than all in him I find. He hath granted me forgiveness. I am his and he is mine. Hallelujah, what a savior. Hallelujah, what a friend. Saving, helping, keeping, loving. He is with me and you to the end. I believe that this Time, of course, on our calendar is definitely a time of remembrance. And I would challenge each and every one of us to take some time through the Gospels and read the account of the suffering that Jesus went through and then his time on the cross. I made it a point recently of taking my audio Bible and just uh, listening to those accounts not going into the resurrection, not dealing with the miracles that Jesus performed until he was going through the betrayal there in the Garden of Gethsemane, but just that period of time. And every one of the Gospels give a portion of uh, their chapters to that. And it would do us well just to stop and think and meditate about what Jesus went through on our behalf. 2,000 years ago, can you imagine the sun's been shining so brightly today that from noon to 3 o'clock it went pitch black as he hung there on the cross. And he cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I don't know that we can really comprehend what Jesus went through on our behalf. It should have been us, but it was him. The sins of the whole world were placed on him. I'm talking about the sins to the time he was on the cross and 
for that particular generation as well as all those after the cross, which would include your sin and my sin was placed on him. It's hard to fathom. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, and I've quoted this often, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Here's the perfect son of God. He didn't know what it meant to even have a dwell on a wrong thought, to think about doing something devious, to steal, as we learn to the children's corner and things of that nature. It says, who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. For a few minutes this evening, I want us to look at four aspects of the Savior. I want us to see the scholarly Savior. I want us to see the servant Savior, the suffering Savior, and the sacrificial Savior. I've not really heard too many people emphasize the scholarly Savior. A former governor of Minnesota mentioned at one time that Christianity was a crutch for weak people. In one sense, he's right. Because Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 5, for without me, you can do nothing. Paul even said, he was a learned man in the ways of the world. He said, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Even in the Old Testament, Samson found out that when he didn't have God's presence and power in his life, he was a defeated man. The scholarly Savior, I invite you to take your Bibles and go to the book of Luke chapter 2. And I want us to see how that even in his humanity, which he chose to take on for himself, he was fully God and yet fully man. Wrap your head around that one if you can. But in Luke chapter 2, I want to read here in verse 41 and following, that even in his humanity, he proved himself to be wise in wisdom and life. It says these words in verse 41, now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. I liked how exact the scripture is. Notice it says in Joseph, because Joseph was not his father. We would say today he's his stepfather, but it says, and his mother, because Mary was with child of the Holy Ghost. And it says here in verse 44, but they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. Twelve years of age. Here's Jesus sitting with the most learned men. He's not talking about medical doctors here. But he says here that he was teaching them, he was hearing them, he was asking questions. And it says, and all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. A lot of people think that if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and you're dedicated to him, that somehow you're an ignoramus. Somehow you're a dummy. Uh, somehow you're just unlearned and ignorant. My friend, Jesus Christ was scholarly. When you have his mind in your lap even right now and trust that one day you'll have it in your heart <laughs> as the, we are admonished to do. Thy word have I hidden in mine heart that I might not sin against God. Uh, we too can have the mind of Christ. We can have wisdom. We can have knowledge. We can have understanding. Go to John, the Gospel of John chapter 6 if you would. We're going to look at several passages here. John chapter 6. There's some people who've been following the Lord Jesus, as was the custom when he went around 
uh, preaching, but not just preaching and teaching, but performing miracles. People wanted to be around that. They wanted to see what they could see and hear what they could hear. They just wanted to be where something was happening. They wanted to know who this prophet was. And of course, Jesus is doing all this to show that he indeed is the promised Messiah. But if you'll go to chapter 6 of John down to verse 67, the Bible says these words, Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? And I'm not going to set the stage for every one of these passages of Scripture, but as he had people following him, of course, as he begins to preach and drive the truth home, there were some that decided, you know what, I, I can't handle this anymore. I, I'm not going to go and uh, be as dedicated, and uh, I'm not going to take the stands that I need to take. And he says, will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. So here we see the scholarly Savior. I mean, he's the one that has the words of eternal life. Some of the so-called learned men of our age and of days gone by, and if the Lord tarries his coming, they'll become, there'll be new ones coming on the horizon, and they think they're smart. And they think, you know, if I can just develop some pill, I'll be able to live forever. I was reading an article recently, and the guy was saying, can we live forever? And I thought, you better know we're going to live forever. But they're looking at it through human eyes, and these are people who give themselves to know and know and know some more. And yet here, the scholarly Savior. Lord, to whom shall we go, Peter says. He said, you're the Christ. You're the anointed of God. God sent you. You have the words of eternal life. To whom shall we go? There's no other place to go. You might be under the sound of my voice tonight, but let me just say, you're not going to find it in some pill. You're not going to find it in an exercise regimen. You're not going to find it by clean living. You're going to find it not in a textbook somewhere. You're going to find it in the person of Jesus Christ. And that's what this day is all about. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Take your Bibles and go to Matthew chapter 22 and we'll see here the importance. And you say, what are you getting at, Pastor? I'm just saying, look, we have the living word in Jesus Christ, but we have the written word in our Bibles. And just as we say we would hunger and thirst to see the Savior, we need to understand that he's given us his word and we can know about him and we can know him. But this is an illustration of just how important it is to know the scriptures. Because you see, Jesus, as our example, knew the word of God. And he says here in verse 23, it says, the same day, this is uh, Matthew 22, the same day came to, uh, excuse me, the same day came to him, the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection. And I always say, that's why they're sad, you see. That's one way you can always remember. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection. The Sadducees didn't. That's why they're sad, you see. I don't know when I heard that, but it just sort of stuck with me. I think it's a cute little thing that helps stick in your mind. It says here in verse 24, saying, Master, Moses said, if a man die, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, the first when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, meaning no children, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise the second also, and the third unto the seventh. Wow. And last of all, the woman died also. Therefore in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. Pretty straightforward. And many of us err because we don't know the scriptures. And here these people, these Pharisees, these Sadducees, they had the scriptures. They had the teaching of this passage of scripture. And Jesus points them right back to the word of God 
And he says, for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of heaven. But as, the touching, but as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. We get impressed when someone knows a lot about this world stuff. But how about the Word of God? This ought to be an encouragement for us to learn our Bibles, to be a student of the Scriptures. And our Savior, as we think about Him, I think we need to see that uh, He's the scholarly Savior. You're not a dummy when you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. It's not misplaced faith. It's not empty faith. The most important decision you'll ever make in your life is to trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. More about Jesus would I know? More of his grace to others show? More of his saving fullness see? More of his love who died for me? More about Jesus let me learn? More of his holy will discern? Spirit of God my teacher be, showing the things of Christ to me. More about Jesus in his word, holding communion with my Lord. Hearing his voice in every line, making each faithful saying mine. More about Jesus on his throne, riches and glory all his own, more of his kingdom's sure increase, more of his coming prince of peace. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness see, more of, of his love who died for me. That's the scholarly Savior. How about the servant Savior? The key verse, I believe, for the 16 chapters in the book of Mark is chapter 10 and verse 45, where the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and give his life a ransom, in other words, a payment for many. He paid our price. The just demands of a holy God were made at Calvary. And that's really what brings us to this place on a Wednesday night in 2021 as we think of just his crucifixion and the suffering he went through on his way to the cross. But we see here that he was the servant savior as well. And you wouldn't expect that of a servant savior. You wouldn't expect a servant savior. You would expect a glorified savior. You would think of a savior who would have people falling down and worshiping him and yet he sets an example for us. Let's go to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Begin reading here, verse 1. And I'll get right to the reading here. And it says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself, continuing to teach his disciples, continuing to give an example for us, continuing to teach us about how we should live. After that he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus saith to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet. In other words, when you get saved, <laughs> you're saved. You have been clean, but now you just need to take that daily cleansing, not for salvation, 
but from the dust and dirt of the world that gathers upon us as we live our lives. He says, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him, therefore said he, ye are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. In other words, serve one another. We love being served, but how about doing things for others? That's the truth he's trying to get across here. He says, for I have given you an example, Jesus our example, that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. One way to have a happy life is to serve others. We get into trouble when we say, nobody's a friend to me. Nobody reaches out to me. Nobody does anything nice to me. Nobody calls me. Nobody invites me. No one, da, 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 da. It's all about me and me and me and mine. And here Jesus is saying, no, you get the towel, you wrap it around, you get the basin of water, and you go wash somebody else's feet. You go serve someone else. That's the way of happiness. People say, oh, I want to be happy. Hey, here it is right here. What does the Bible say? If you know these things, <laughs> Happy are ye if you do them. So you want happiness? Serve. And we have Jesus as the servant savior. He didn't come to minister, uh, be ministered unto, but to minister, it says, and to give his life. And you stop and think about the life of Christ. I mean, here he is at age 12, uh, talking to the uh, learned people of his day in the synagogues. And then he goes out and he goes to a wedding and he performs his first public uh, miracle at the age of 30. And then he begins to do miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. Just doing this for other people, healing them, causing the blind to see and the, the uh, deaf to hear and the, the lame to walk. And he raises people from the dead. I mean, my, that's the kind of say he wore himself daily out so that he could serve others. Pointing people to the Savior. So you have the servant Savior. How about the suffering Savior? I can't help as I was thinking about this. I said, Lord, I'd, there are a lot of passages of Scripture I could go to in regards to this. But uh, I did it just a, a couple of weeks ago when we were having communion. And I thought again of Isaiah chapter uh, 53. That great passage of Scripture that talks about the suffering that our Lord Jesus went through. And I want to read that passage again. And then we're going to go to another passage in Luke 22. It says, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. It's talking about Jesus. You stop and think about what he went through. And that's why I say it, it do us well to read that portion of scripture or listen to that portion of scripture being read to us about the suffering that Jesus went through. I mean, he was beaten to where there was no form nor comeliness. I mean, stop and think about having a, crown of thorns platted upon your head, placed on your head, but not just gently placed. It was placed on his head and driven into his head. And if you've been to Israel, you'll see those spikes on those thorns. They're not just little rosebush thorns that you might think of. They're like spikes. And they would go into the skin and just dig itself in and the blood would begin to run down. And then the guys would take their hands and they would actually begin to rip the hair. I mean, guys with beards, grip your beard and just give it a yank. That hurts. And yet they did that to our Savior. They would just yank at that. They'd spit on his face. They blindfolded him and slapped at him and buffeted him and said, hey, if you're God, why don't you just 
tell us who hit you. Uh, they're going to hear their names, I believe, at the great white throne judgment if they didn't get saved. Yeah, that was you that hit me. And now that guy will fall down on his knees and confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You think about how they stripped him. They mocked him. The Bible says in one portion of the scripture, they derided him. They reviled him. I mean, just unbelievable atrocity. They scourged him. And some people think that, oh, you know, Pilate was just between a rock and a hard place, and he was caught between the politics of his day, and yet at the same time, he didn't just say, you know, hey, here's Jesus, you have at him, you do with him what you want. He did say that, but the Bible says he also scourged Jesus before he released them to the Jews. In other words, he tortured Jesus. So Jesus went through torture after torture, not because he was guilty. The Bible says that they even put up false witnesses. But the false witnesses didn't even agree among themselves. So they went out and got more false witnesses and couldn't get them to agree either. But at the same time, they were bearing false witness against him. And people were believing it. And Jesus just stood there and answered not a word. He did that because of you, because of me. It's hard to fathom, amen? He goes on to say in verse 3, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. And you know that despised means thought little of. Who is this? Isn't this, you know, uh, the son of Joseph and Mary and the brethren? We got him right here with us. Jesus, even in his lifetime, couldn't do many miracles in his hometown because of their unbelief. Surely he hath borne our griefs, verse 4, and carried our sorrows. Notice that it's our griefs. Our sorrows. He was bruised not for his own iniquities. I mean, when somebody does wrong and they get nailed for it, we just say, they got what they deserved. But Jesus didn't deserve what he got. And it says, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord, Jehovah, hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence. Neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. The suffering Savior. In Luke chapter 22, I'm basically going to just look at one verse here uh, that has always stood out to me in this, this passage. And I don't know uh, how Peter did, handled it, to be honest with you. As you know, Peter made the uh, prideful statement that he would not allow Jesus to be taken. 
and that he would stand with Jesus and be loyal to him no matter what. And Jesus says, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. And of course, Peter denied that he would ever do that. And we find that as Judas comes into the garden and puts the kiss of betrayal on the cheek of Jesus, and we find the soldiers taking Jesus away, it says that the disciples all scattered and ran. Peter followed from a long distance. He slips in to the courtyard where the hearing has taken place for Jesus. There's a bunch of soldiers and others around observing, and they're warming themselves by a fire. And of course, the uh, ladies come along and they say, you know, you were with him. And he says, no. And he ultimately curses and swears that he does not know Jesus. It's hard to fathom. He says, I don't know him. I don't know the man. Curses and swears. And the Bible here says in verse 61, after that third betrayal, and the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. I marvel at that verse of Scripture. A lot of times when we think about this time, we just think that maybe when he cursed and swore and denied the Lord that third time, that it just popped in his mind and said, Oh yeah, I remember Jesus said I would do this. And I said I'd never do that. No, but when he said that, he turned and looked at Jesus. I don't know that man. Jesus turned and their eyes locked. I can't imagine that. You wonder what it must have been like for Peter. The conviction that hit his soul. And he goes out and weeps bitterly. And I wonder what it's going to be like at the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment of the believers. I stand before him. And Jesus looks at me and our eyes lock. What time, <laughs> what's that going to be like? What's that going to be like for all of us? Because we'll all have our set time. We'll stand before the Savior and give an account. That's a, that's a thought provoker right there. How convicting. And you know, that's one reason why it's so important, I believe, to look in the Word of God as I was thinking about that and the look of the Savior. I thought of uh, James. In James chapter uh, 1 and verse 22, it says these words, But be ye doers of the Word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves, for if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. The word of God is like looking at Jesus right there. His eyes meeting our eyes. And that's why when we're right with him, we have no problem spending time in the word. But when we're not right with him, we drop our head in shame. We want to go the other way. We want to follow maybe at a distance or run for the hills. The suffering Savior. Consider that tonight. Consider that in the next few days before we celebrate, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. So we need to understand, though, that there was a price to be paid before the resurrection. How about the sacrificial Savior? Let's go to John chapter 19. I'm almost done. John chapter 19. And he bearing his cross went forth, this is verse 17, into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. And of course, when you go to Israel and you look 
past that uh, Damascus gate and you look right now, the place where they probably looked up and saw the uh, hill of Golgotha, uh, it's a parking lot now. It's a, uh, they have buses and, and taxis that you hear the horns honking all the time, but if you go and walk around the city of Jerusalem and you're on top of the wall, you can look right over into the garden and the garden tomb area and you see Golgotha there. He says, where they crucified him and two other with him, on either side one and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, write not the King of the Jews, but that he said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, that's John, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. After this Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Notice that, scripture fulfilled, scripture fulfilled, scripture fulfilled. He says, I thirst. Now there was a set of vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they brake not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water, and he that saw it bear record, and, this, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith it true, that ye might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him was not broken. <laughs> and says, and again another scripture saith, they shall look upon him whom they pierced. It's an amazing passage of scripture. Those guys weren't sitting there with a, with a, uh, a scroll saying, okay, now this is what we have to do next to fulfill what is written in the scriptures. No, they were just doing what they were doing. And yet they were fulfilling scripture after scripture after scripture, just as God had said. And remember, his word has been settled since the foundation of the world. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Amen. In John chapter 3. Verse 14, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Remember the brass snake. Brass is a symbol of judgment in the scriptures. The snake is the serpent, always a picture of the devil, if you please. And just as those fiery serpents had been going through and slithering through the children of Israel and over 70,000 of them died because of their murmuring and complaining against God, we find all they had to do is Moses put that old stick in the air with that old serpent, says, you just look and you'll live. And that's what the correlation he's making. Jesus Christ was judged for our sin and he was lifted up and if you simply look to him for your salvation, you'll be saved. You'll be healed from the bite of the serpent, the sin that entered in the world. 
and death by sin. That whosoever believeth in him, verse 15, should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. Verse 36, he that believeth on the son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. I ran across an account here from one of the wars. It was written by D.W. Whittle. And it's the account here of Willie Lear, the substitute. Willie Lear lived in Palmyra, Missouri. In 1862, he was a young man of about 18 years of age. Like most of those who lived in his neighborhood, he sympathized with the South in the Civil War, which was at that time in progress. The Union forces occupied Palmyra and had control of the district. Outrages were committed on both sides and many indefensible deeds were or are recorded in the local histories of those sad times. Union soldiers were shot down from behind hedges and Union men were driven away from their homes and sometimes foully treated. To avenge these things and to check them, the federal commander arrested and imprisoned a large number of the citizens. They were all charged with being guerrillas and after trial by court-martial were all sentenced to be shot. Willie Lear was among the number. After his condemnation, the general decided to select 10 of the number of those condemned for immediate execution and reserve the remainder under hope of pardon if outrages in the neighborhood ceased or for future punishment if not. These 10 were drawn by lot. Willie Lear was not among this number. A neighbor of Lear's who was among the number to be shot was terribly distressed at the thought of his situation. He was a fa the father of a large family, a poor man, and the thought of the helpless condition in which he would leave his loved ones was very distressing to him. Lear saw all of this and it deeply moved him. He stepped forward to the commanding officer and offered to take his neighbor's place. The officer had no objection. The order had been issued that 10 men of the number should be shot. And if that number was made up, the law would be satisfied. The neighbor with the deepest gratitude accepted Lear as his substitute. And so by the acquiescence of the three parties concerned, the representative of the law, the condemned by the law, and the satisfier of the law by substitution, the matter was settled. Willie Lear took the place of his friend in line with the nine men drawn up before a detachment prepared with loaded rifles and at the command, fire! He, with the others, fell, riddled with bullets, his blood soaking the earth. As the man for whom he died looked upon that blood and beheld that mangled body, what would be his thought? Would he not say with streaming eyes, he died for me? I owe my life to him. Oh, that I could do anything to show my gratitude to one who has done so much for me. If he were asked, how is it that you are delivered from the sentence that was hanging over you, would he be apt to ignore the work of his substitute? By magnifying the importance of some fancied work of his own in the acceptance of the substitute? Would he say, oh, I was saved by my faith and by my determination to live a better life? It is all by faith in the development of character. Would he have been so ungrateful as to leave out all mention of the death of that noble young man in his stead as the alone cause of his escape? If he would, he was not worth dying for. And it was a curse to his family and the community that he was spared. But no, he never returned such answers. He could not treat the act of his friend with such indifference. Men for whom Christ died on the cross talk that way. But this man never did. He never tired of telling how Willie Lear had saved him and gladly acknowledged his obligation to him. It says here, do you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins? 
Do you believe that because he died for your sins and you have accepted him, your sins are forgiven? Believing in him and are you confessing him and striving to show your gratitude by a life consecrated to his service? Oh, let us who are Christ never tire of telling the story of redemption by his blood. Let us never rob him of his glory as our alone Savior and Redeemer by attributing our salvation from sin and our hope of eternal life to anything else than his death upon the cross for our sins. We greatly err when we think that any other gospel or any other form of the gospel will be more successful in reaching men, no matter what they are or who they are. No man can be saved without the power of God being put forth to save him. And as God has decreed that the preaching of the cross is the power of God, we must, if we would see men saved, preach the cross. And the meaning of that is, this is my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Christ is the sinner's substitute. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die, would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Was it for crimes that I have done? He groaned upon the tree, amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. Well might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in when Christ, the mighty maker, died for man, the creature's sin. But drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I'm happy all the day.